Welcome to Ruby Thursday. I'm Melissa Wanish. This Ruby Roundtable was recorded on November 18, 2015. Thanks again to our awesome hosts, AlphaSites. At this meetup, our guest speaker, Kyle Doherty of AlphaSites, shared tips, tools, and processes for diving into legacy code. Enjoy this recording of the Ruby Roundtable. All right. Yes, it's working. Welcome, everyone. I'm Melissa Wanish, and I'm founder of Ruby Thursday, a tutorial site for junior Rails developers. And I want to welcome you to this month's Ruby Roundtable. Yay! Yay! Woo! An awesome, awesome shout out to Alpha Size for hosting this awesome space and food and beer. So let's give them a round of applause. Yay, Alpha Size! All right, so we have two presentations today. Very exciting. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Kyle for our first one. Hey, everyone. Can everyone hear me? I'm going to just gonna set this down and try to talk. Just one, more. one more? Okay, yeah. It's a little light dimmer right there. Uh, it's like if one of the switches will see a little thing on the right side <laughs> or that. Can everyone hear me like in the back? Okay, so um, what I'm going to be talking about today is basically how to tackle legacy code. So I'm a junior developer here at Alpha Sites. Uh, before that, I went to Flatiron. Um, so before I started working here, you know, I had built some applications, um, kind of like your standard first Rails apps. Um, you maybe had, I don't know, I think the largest one I built, we had like six to eight models or something like that. Um, and then I got here. And, you know, we have uh, our largest application, this one, Pistachio, you can see has 45,000 commits. Um, it's been around since 2006. If I pull up Navicat, which you guys can see, um, there's like all these different tables. So it's just like a very large code base in relation to what I've been working on previously. Um, and so there's a lot of things that I learned um, or that I have learned in the past year about sort of how to tackle um, a code base like this. Um, and I think that's good, one, because, uh, or the things that I'm going to talk about I think are beneficial because, one, you may start working on code like this or you may be working on code like this. Also, um, it can help you if you're working on with libraries. Um, so about four or five months ago, uh, I made sort of my first uh, open source commits um, that got merged into uh, a small library. Um, and I couldn't have done that if I hadn't been comfortable doing this sort of thing, just like go into a brand new code base I didn't know. Um, and now I'm planning to start to like tackle, um, maybe try to do some Rails stuff. Um, so before I get started, um, there's this cool site, and the reason I bring this up is because, what was it, three or four meetups ago, we talked about open source and, and trying to get into open source. So there's this really cool site called Code Triage which is created by Richard Sheens, which I don't know if any of you are familiar with him, um, but he's the developer that works for um, Heroku. Um, he's a Rails, he's committed, done a bunch of commits to Rails, um, really good, and he created this so that you can sign up, um, and it'll basically choose what projects you want to follow. So I've, I've already selected that I want to be working in uh, Rails, and then it'll just email me issues every day that I can sort of like look into. Um, so. At this point, like all I've done is just like looked at what the issues are and just sort of perused them. But you can start like that's a good way to start getting comfortable with open source. Um, and I'll come back to this um, in a bit. So um, one thing uh, before I get started too, uh, I just want to let you know I didn't do slides today. And the reason that I didn't make slides is I wanted it, like this Ruby Roundtable. We try to be very interactive, um, which I found out kind of sucks for me because I'm realizing that slides are like a massive crutch and it's like way easier for the presenter to just like sit here and follow slides. Um, but what I want to do is try to go through, um, give an actual example of something that I worked on this past iteration, so this last two weeks, and just show you some of the tools and stuff that I used along the way to sort of solve the problem that I was trying to solve. Um, so um, two things that I'm not, oh, this obviously isn't going to be comprehensive, it's going to be in the, um, it's going to be framed around tackling something with a Rails application. Um, and it's, like I said, it's not going to be comprehensive. I'm not going to go over Pry, um, just because I feel like 
there's tons of tutorials out there on Pry. Everyone's probably familiar with Pry. Um, if you're not, just go Google like Pry tutorial, and I'll talk, you know, show you how to use Pry. Next step, uh, play a specific line, that sort of thing. I'm also not going to go over web developer tools um, because, again, like if if you've been developing for even a very short period of time, you're probably familiar with those. You can go watch a bunch of YouTube videos on that. Um, so I'm not going to go into that as much. Um, so the first thing that uh, I wanted to show is I basically just want to start with the problem that I had, um, or specifically a card that I had to solve or, or take on that day. Um, so this card, uh, this is Pivotal Tracker. Um, if any of you work in like iterations, uh, sprints with cards that you tackle, um, you're probably familiar with this or Trello. Um, so this was a really simple card. Um, all I had to do was uh, we needed to give our users um, the ability to edit their LinkedIn URL. So this app that I showed you um, the code for, or just showed you the repo for, this is the main, our largest application here. It's the application that lets all our users, all our employees get their job done. It's kind of like a very customized CRM and project management software. Um, so they have their LinkedIn profiles connected to their user account in Pistachio. And then that um, is displayed to our clients. Um, we essentially have sort of like a client portal and they know that they work with John and Kelly and a bunch of other people, and if they want to like learn more about them, they can click on their LinkedIn URLs. Um, the issue that we were having was, for whatever reason, these were getting corrupted. Something was happening, and they weren't linking properly. And every once in a while, um, and so they needed to go in and be able to edit that. Um, now, obviously, you'd probably sit here and say, like, okay, that's probably a larger problem. There's something wrong with your integration with LinkedIn, and that's true. Um, but this is something I can do in like two hours. And digging into why like LinkedIn isn't like working all the time, um, but most of the time with our application is like probably a bigger thing to tackle. So that's something we're going to do down the road. This is a quick fix. Um, so, anyways, um, and then here, like without going into everything, you can see like whoever created this card can say, "Oh, we need to populate this field with the existing LinkedIn profiles." I think it's in a table called LinkedIn Persons. Um, Oh, yeah, sorry. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I, there's not much to see here, but um, just that, uh, you know, I need to go. So, basically, I need to go figure out, like, where is this table that I need to, like, update this, this data on, the URL, and then where am I going to do that in the UI, and where is that in the code? Um, so, that's what I need to do. Um, so, that's what I'm going to start, like, walking through and showing you, like, all the tools that, that I use to do that. Um, one thing, two things that I want to go over before we dive into that. Um, let me expand this. Obviously, like this, everyone knows like how a request works in Rails. Um, I don't want to like labor on this, but it's just something that I found. Um, even though you know it, and you probably know it by heart, you know it in your sleep. Just like always being aware of where in this um, sort of request flow are you, wherever, whenever you're working on code. Um, I've found that a lot of times um, I'll get like really bogged down by the details of like the specific method I'm working in and what it's doing. And then when I'm, I'm about to move on to the next thing, I'll be like, wait, uh, I, I don't know what to do now. And, it's, and really, if I just stop and think about, okay, where am I in this request flow? Um, am I, do I need to, like, am I in the controller? I need to now like change some data on a model or in, in the, the uh, database. Um, and like, what action am I in? Is it index action, edit, that sort of thing? So I think just always being aware of this and always just like, if you get stuck, just stop and say like, okay, where am I in this? Um, and just by the way, this is a really good talk just to like uh, watch um, on how requests work. Um, kind of goes into more detail on like web servers, app servers, all that stuff. Um, and then the other thing that I always find handy to, to make sure you know, and this is sort of like fundamental things to just always be thinking about, is once you get into, once you track down where you need to do stuff in code, you're probably just going to start following methods around to figure out what's going on. Um, and so understanding all the ways that a method can be defined in a, in a, um, in a model, and specifically a model that uh, inherits from active record. Um, how can those all be defined? So just wanted to like go through real quick. This is kind of, I mean, you can see here, this like is a massive class. Advisorship is definitely a god class in our application, almost a thousand lines of code. Um, 
And so like pretty much every way you can, can create a class, like it's in here. Um, so obviously you have instance methods, right? Um, or every way you can create a method. Um, so you have instance methods. You have, um, obviously, if you do def self, we have class methods, right? Um, then your class can also, um, it can inherit methods, right? So obviously we have active record. Everyone knows that. But some other ones that you may not always think about is like, oh, like this is delegating a bunch of shit to all these other classes. And if I don't, like, know that, I might be like, oh, okay, I'm in a view, and some the view's calling some method uh, name, but when I go in here and I search, like, def name, I'm like, ah, oh, crap, like, where is that getting that from? Um, so, like, I always just go check, like, is it being delegated to something else? Um, another thing that you want to look at, too, is like, oh, okay, it, are modules being included? So this has a bunch of modules, right? Um, you can see like advisorship scheduling. So this class has all these other methods from this module. So same thing, I might come into the class and be like, oh, I saw the schedule call time for advisor being called, but I don't see it defined. Um, and like once you start thinking like this, you'll start to get an intuition for your, your different code bases that you work on. And now a lot of times I can see a method name and if I look in the class and don't see it there, I'll, I usually am like, oh, I bet this is a module or I bet this is like a gem, um, and I'll, I'll be able to like track down the, the method that way. Um, there, how else can we define a method? Like any other ways? Like class methods? Maybe like a scope? So this also has a ton of scopes, right? So like that's kind of like a class method, basically, right? Like. You might see, see these get called um, on the actual class. And then another thing to be aware of is this class self. I don't know if anyone's ever seen this, but um, I hadn't seen it until I ran into this model before. But essentially, just, it's the same thing as doing def self, but it lets you kind of you know, create a bunch of different methods inside that. Uh, it's actually, um, Opti Grimm has a cool, a good video, a short video on uh, class self on Ruby Tapas, and he basically, and I kind of agree with him. He just says, like, you know, it doesn't really save you that much time compared to doing, like, def self class name. Um, and if this were to get, if, if say we had, like, 20 of these inside self, it would be easy for that to go past the, like, what I could see on the page, right? And I might be in that method thinking it's an instance method, and really I'm in a class method, and I'm, like, banging my head against the wall trying to figure out why it's not worth, uh, working. So I think that's, like, probably just stay away from doing that. I mean, it, you maybe kind of look cool because you don't see it that often, but I don't think it's really worth it. Um, so yeah, anyways, like I just wanted to stop and talk about those two things. So I think if you always sort of create these mental checklists in your mind, you know, when you're getting super frustrated with something and you're kind of seeing red, it's easy to like forget these simple things. And um, so I always just like make sure I go through these steps in my mind. Um, okay. So back to this card. So basically, like how I tackle, um, you know, I don't know. I've never worked with the LinkedIn stuff with this user. I have no idea where it is. So the first thing I want to do is find some sort of entry point. Um, so for me, I knew like, okay, I know this is on the user. I kind of just want to go to the UI and just like check out what a user looks like. Um, so I'm only showing me. I'm not like super vain. I just don't want to show people that work here as personal information. So that's why I'm going on mine. Um, but um, yeah, so here I see like, oh, I can associate my LinkedIn with my profile. That's cool. I bet like that's, that probably saves the URL to some class. Um, and I know that I want to stick this field somewhere here. Um, so assuming, I'm, I'm assuming that my user class has some other class that has the, the column that I want to save to, and this page is where I'm going to edit, where I'm going to add like a nested attribute in a form, right? But I still don't know like where I'm going. Um, but, so now there's like a bunch of different things I can do. And, and really all I'm going to be showing you is like all these different tools that you can just like have at your disposal to try to like figure things out. So now I know, that what 
my boss wrote was like, oh, I think this is LinkedIn persons. And I could go into the code and try to find that. Um, or what I can do is come into Navicat. Let me see if I can make this bigger. Can everyone see these okay? A little small. Let me see if it's going to let me zoom. All right, well, it's not really only Zoom, you just have to trust me what it says here. Basically, it just has a LinkedIn, LinkedIn people table, LinkedIn targets, and LinkedIn users. And my boss says LinkedIn persons, but that doesn't really sound like what I want, probably, because I know that I'm dealing with users. So now I'm like, okay, there's a bunch of different LinkedIn tables. I don't know if that's what I want, but let me go into the code. Um, and LinkedIn person, Okay, there is a LinkedIn person, but it belongs to an advisor and it belongs to a client contact. So I know because I work on this app that we also associate LinkedIn profiles with our clients and the people that we hire to basically consult for our clients. So I know like that's wrong. So my boss is trying to help me out and he sort of did, like I'm on the right path, but that's not what I want. But I know that in Navicat, and does anyone use any tools like Navicat to like look into your, da your database? Yeah, it's like, do you find it really helpful for it? Uh, well, I don't do it on the class, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, like, it's one of those things, like, you don't think you need it. Like, I remember someone told me about it, I was like, I don't, I don't need that. Like, I can just do Rails DB, which you can, but one, this is way nicer, um, and it's also just, like, it's just quick to use. You don't have to wait for Rails DB to load up. Um, this is also on a reader to my production database versus, like, Rails DB is just going to be my dev environment. Like whatever I have seeded, right? Um, so this, I, I have like all the production database, um, and I can quickly look at tables. I can like just run SQL queries. I can also like test SQL queries, see how they're going to do against production data. Um, so I definitely recommend using something like this. Um, so, anyways, I know that LinkedIn users was another class or table. So I bet there's a LinkedIn user. Oh, there you go. Thank you. This is really small right here, so it's hard to see. Um, so yeah, so now I know I have this LinkedIn user. Great. Um, so this is definitely what what I want, right? Um, so at this point, I just went into Rails DB. Uh, that's the class that I want, and. So now, now I'm just trying to figure out like what column am I trying to, to edit here. Um, so I just fired up Rails DB, checked out what column it is or what, what columns there are on LinkedIn users, and public profile URL sounds pretty much what I need, like what I need. So now I know that all I need to do is come into here, figure out what page I'm on here, um, and just like add a, a nested form or nested field. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways you could figure this out. Obviously, like this one's nice because you can just see it's employee management. That's probably my controller, it's edit. Um, but one thing that I like to use, uh, I don't really need it in this instance, but if you have um, Rails panel installed, does anyone use Rails panel? No? Um, so of course I can, I can like, Go into just have my server running if I can get this to you expand. So I have my server running and I can just like hit this and see like what happened. I can see like, oh, it sent a patch to employee management. It's the employee management controller update action. Um, so like now I know okay where I need to go in the code, but like that can be really annoying to work with. Um, sometimes you have like tons of output that's like you know zooming past your screen. With Rails panel, I can just see here. Um, 
okay, I'm on the faces controller show page. I can see like what's happening in active record. Um, and the thing that I use it a lot for is seeing like what partials are rendered, which again, you can also see in your server logs, but this is way easier to parse visually in my opinion. And I always have the developer tools open anyways. So it's just like kind of nice to have it there. Um, so if you wanna use this, um, you just go into Chrome store and, and download it to Chrome. Um, and then all you need to do is add meta request under development um, in your app, and then you'll have this. Um, and it can be a nice little tool um, for figuring things out. So at this point, I know that I need to go to employee management, edit. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, I probably need to go to like employee management, edit, oh, there's, let's see, fields. That still doesn't look like what I want. Um, and like you can, I probably could like figure out where this is, but also if you just look on the page and figure out like what's probably just hard coded into like the ERB file or in our case Haml, oh, there it is, employee management, user settings form. Okay, that's the one I wanted. Here's like all those fields that are on the page. And now I can go like about editing that. Um, just to show like how this is helpful. So here you can see like all the partials. That's big enough, okay, cool. Uh, position fields, like here down here I can see like here's positions, that's probably what that is. So if I had to edit this, I can look in here and be like, oh, I bet it's position fields and like find that immediately. So like that's just an example of how it can save you a ton of time. Um, so at this point like I pretty much know what I need to do, right? Like I'm gonna, like probably just copy this, do like a fields for, right? And just do like nested attributes and save straight, save to um, LinkedIn user, which has that profile URL column on it and I'm done. And that's pretty much what I did. One small problem that I ran into is that we have, because this app has been around for so long, we had auto save set to false. Um, what auto save does is if you're, um, if you have, like uh, other models that, that are um, associated with another one, if you save like the parent one, it saves all the data on the, the children. Because that was set to false, <coughs> nested attributes wasn't working for me. Um, eventually I went to Abe, who's somewhere around here, and like he helped me figure that that was set to false. Um, and we figured that out. But um, for the most part, like this didn't take me that long to figure out because I had all these different tools at my disposal. Um, and just like, when you just have these, like then, then you just like can figure things out really quick. Um, another thing I could have done if I wanted to, if I didn't want to like do Rails DB to figure out what um, what was on LinkedIn user, what columns there were, you know, you can just come into sorry, to work. You just come into Rails console. be like, oh, okay, LinkedIn user, like what does it have on it? Like that's another way to do it, right? Um, I also use this a lot when I was trying to like figure out um, a few other things. So like I always, I'm always in Rails console. Um, it's another reason why, if you're, is there, does everyone use iTerm2? Yeah, does everyone else just use normal terminal? I would definitely, I mean, use what you want, but iTerm2 is nice because you can split panes up all over the place and just have a bunch of panes open. Um, I haven't started to use Tmux and Tmuxinator yet, but I definitely, that's on my list to do. And the reason that I want to do that is because you can just set projects up and create the shortcut in your terminal. So I can basically just say pistachio and it would like open up four different panes with Rails server going. When we run this application, I have to have a couple other things running. Um, so it'll just like boot that all for you. Do you have a question? Like, like item two? No, I mean it's just a terminal. So it's just like your normal terminal in with Mac. Yeah. Oh, um, Replace it built in terminal. Yeah. Nice. So this is not Tmux. This is just term two panes. Yeah, it's just I term two panes. Okay. I haven't set up Tmux okay. yet. Better Tmux, but like it has the built-in Tmux integration, but I don't use it. Yeah, I mean I can. I have it set up. Um, just have it with like the ASCII slider. <laughs> yeah. So like if I do. Tmux, it'll start a new Tmux session for me. I just haven't set up like 
team up tonight and all that. So I'm gonna, I was thinking about trying to squeeze that into this, but I don't have time to like. Well, if you're on Linux, they use uh, Terminator, and it will let you uh, divide up your screen however you like. Nice. Yeah, I mean this will too, so I can like just like go all day. Um, Yeah, uh, no, so um, let me just open the pull request. Um, let me unify it. So it was, you have the user and then it has one LinkedIn user, right? And so autosave was set to false on that, so we had to just explicitly set it to true. Generally it's set to true, I believe always, unless you explicitly turn it, set it to false. And I believe also, if you're using accepts nested attributes for, which we are for LinkedIn user, then it should set it to true. But I guess because we had it set to false somewhere, it was like overriding that. It was something really weird, but we had to just set auto save true. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much what we did. Um, did you just get a type of LinkedIn user already? Um, so no, so. Like this is a, a PR that was just like a quick fix. I have to go back and uh, like you can see you like associate your account. Um, everyone here has a LinkedIn account because they're on LinkedIn all day, basically like headhunting. It's kind of like what we do, except we're finding experts that can answer questions. Like an example is one of my coworkers, uh, one of his clients came to him and said, "We want to." And some people probably have heard this. I apologize, but we want to invest in a company that sells canned catfish in South Korea and we need to talk to like experts in that industry and we need to talk to them tomorrow by 12 <laughs> and so like that's what that's what like people here do that aren't on the software team um, but yeah like we're what we're going to do is we're going to change this we're going to get rid of this we're going to move it over here we're just going to have a little refresh button that you just ref if something happens to the link you just refresh it and it ha handles it because right now like obviously letting a user edit it themselves like they might screw up yeah. It's not the best, but it's like a quick fix and it works. Yeah. I was just thinking about nested, nested attributes setting the uh, setting the field on the object that doesn't exist. Oh yeah, it's it uh, it'll cr it create yeah. it, yeah. and it won't it won't show up here if yeah. the object's not there. So I just have a quick <laughs> if, if statement in here. Um, so yeah, I just didn't want to go into like how I implemented this exactly. It was more like how I got there. Um, so a few other things that I wanted to go over that I didn't really get to cover in this one or this example. Um, so there's some pretty cool stuff you can do with Ruby and there's a really cool talk um, by the same guy who created Code Triage um, called Dissecting Ruby with Ruby. And so I'm gonna go real quickly into that. Um, so what you can do And can everyone see that okay? Yeah. Um, so I'll go back into that user class and you normally can't do this. We like hacked user. So you either have to use the ID but I can use my initials. Let me try to Right, so I have I have my user, um, and that maybe there's like some method, um, like I, I don't know a method, but I bet there's like a URL method on user, and it's getting called into view. Um, so I'm gonna do that. That user is me. I'm gonna say method uh, URL, and then I can do source location. And that that didn't work because I guess I don't have that method, but. Um, I can pick like any method that's in there. Um, lock. That's LinkedIn user. Oh, is that? Thank you.
So what's cool about this is that it'll tell me exactly where that method is defined and like what line it's on. So like obviously like I just looked at user and saw that it was there, but um, like this can be really helpful um, when you're doing things. The other thing is um, another way you can do this. So I don't really want to have to like find a user every time, like do like user dot last. Um, I can just do user and then instance method, and then it'll do the same thing. So like that, that's pretty cool. Um, and what's really nice about this is a lot of times you'll see a method and you're like, remember I said like, oh, go through that checklist of where, like how a method could be defined. But like that takes a long time to like check every one of those. And it could just end up being in, in a gem. And then you just like went through all these different ways it could be defined and it's in, in a gem. So if you do this, it'll actually tell you uh, where, where it is in a gem. So for instance, we can say user, um, I think it's update attribute. Yeah, update attribute is in active record 4.2, whatever, persistence RB. Um, so like you can be like, oh, it's an active record. Um, and then if you, if you thought like you had a bug with this, um, then you could, in active record, um, cause there's lots of bugs in active record. Um, you can just do bundle open and then active record. Oh, do I have to do the 4.2? Cause you're in the console. I think it'll still, oh right, there, yeah, right. I thought it would let me. Yeah, so then you can just open it up. And we saw it's in persistence. And what line? 237. So then I can, I can see update attribute right here, which is kind of cool. Um, you can do like generated methods to like like database fields. I think Rails will be nice. That's why they like put the when they like generate the method, they put kind of like a source location stuff in there. What can you do? Like so, like like generated methods from database fields. Like you can get the you can get like like locations from them that aren't gibberish, even though like they're not actually defined anywhere. Oh right, right, right yeah, yeah. Nice. yeah, yeah. So if I did it for name on user, yeah, I would say that it's active record attribute method, which is nice. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's another thing too, it's good. Um, but yeah, it's kind of cool and like the reason, the other reason I think this is cool is if you then decide to go and code triage and you get an email with like one of these, an issue for Rails, um, um, then you can, you know, you can start to like dig into it and see what's going on and just like track it down. Whereas like, I don't think I actually knew about source location or anything until about like four months ago and I never would even, I, someone would have been like, oh yeah, you should look into something in Active Record. I would have been like, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you, you go do that. <laughs> um, so yeah, like I think those are some things that help me. There's lots of other tools out there. Um, I know I didn't have slides, but I, ha I basically am kind of gonna do like what they do on podcasts, like show notes. I have a bunch of notes. I'll just like stick them in the, the meetup with links to a bunch of different things um, that I think are helpful, or at least that helped me a lot, um, and hopefully you'll find it helpful. That's all I got. <laughs>